boop. Hi, chat. <laughs> How are we all doing today? How are we doing? We're in a cozy fit. We're we're in the cozy fit today. We're in the chill cozy times. You know what? Question about Mythos and Magic, are we going to see more of it in the future? So, the reason why I'm in such a D&D &D mood is because I'm planning the next Mythos and Magic stream. <laughs> I have been working on it, and now I just am in a very D&D &D mood. Thank <laughs> you for the hydrate. But yes, we have agreed to expand it into more than just a one shot or it's two shot it might be a whole little mini campaign but today uh i wanted to talk about the world building lore because i have poured so much into it and this won't be any spoilers for the campaign it's kind of just like background stuff on how i've my like homebrewed a greek D, &D world uh, so I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about it. <laughs> I want to talk about it because <laughs> it's fun. But I thought today would be a fun cozy boy. We are in, we're in the hat ghosty, ghosty crocheted for me. I'm in my D and D pants. Look at these pants. They're gay and they're dice. <laughs> I'm in the Sherb merch <laughs> and the Philza merch. We're just, we're vibing. We're chilling. So we're chilling. And we got we're gonna we're gonna have the the mythos and magic music on and we're gonna talk about funky world things where it's just me being a, a just it's just the intersection of two of my hyperfixations, D D and Greek mythology. <laughs> uh, also we have some fun little sub goals. I thought I'd put a bunch of like itty bitty sub goals. We have like a bunch of little baby boys. So we got for five, well, six, six subs, uh, a new emote. Look at that little guy. He's surprised Pika Ray, except he's also gay because it's like, I'm so in love with my boyfriends. <laughs> I love him. Uh, and then the next one is some lore scraps, little lore scraps. And the next one, basically we'll go in little bits of five, uh, is, uh, the CMV mock-up, because tomorrow, Daniel and I are going out to film a new CMV. So, I think that's fun. <laughs> exactly, it's what he looks like when he sees any of his boyfriends and he's just like, <laughs> yay. Uh, so, I thought it'd be fun to have a bunch of little mini sub goals as we just talk about D&D &D things. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's what we're doing today. Is it the mother seeing me? Uh, no, it is Fable and Isla. It is a Fable and Isla CMV to a song called How Did You Love? How Do You Love? I know what song I'm doing things to. <laughs> uh, so it's Fable and Isla, and I'm excited. <laughs> mm. There wasn't a hydrate there. I was just thirsty. <laughs> so, yeah, we get the mock-up, which is uh, not like a. It's literally just like words to kind of uh, tag how it's gonna how it's gonna go, and I'm very excited. We have the fits ready. We have uh, we just we just have vibes, and I'm excited, and I'm just pumped. I have a venue rented. I rent. I paid money to rent a venue that we could film in. So that it's cool. <laughs> but do you guys wanna do you guys wanna learn about mythos and magic things? Do you guys wanna learn about mythos and magic things with me? <laughs> so uh I'm gonna start off with the history of our world. Uh and I'm gonna actually show you guys my D my DM's notebook. Uh I have a I actually use OneNote for planning my campaign. <laughs> um, so I have my lovely OneNote that has a bunch of like tabs and pages and stuff. Uh, and I will say some of my world lore, I might have to say like, this might not be up to date. Cause this is a lot of my planning from when I first ran uh, 
this kind of little one shot and that turned into a campaign as well. Um, so some things might have been updated since then that I just haven't gone through and, and updated everything yet. But you guys get to peek behind the curtains and see my DM notebook. Uh, which, by the way, if any of my players are watching, it's actually fine for you to watch this. There will be no campaign spoilers. <laughs> I'm not going to get into the storyline. I'm just getting into the world lore. Uh, so, teehee. <laughs> Let's go over here, shall we? Boop. Look at this. So this is my this is my OneNote. This is my lovely little guy. Uh, I have it cropped so that you guys can't see some things that would be spoilers. Lol. Um, but... Basically what I've done and the things I'm going to go over today is the history of Arcadia, which is what the world that Mythos and Magic takes place in is called. How the different races were created. The heroes, so Greek heroes kind of being restyled a little bit and the planes of existence. Uh, so I'm, I'm, it's, it's cool. It's cool. It looks confusing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's neat, <laughs> but uh, I guess, you know what, chat, do you guys want voting powers? I think I could give you voting powers. You can decide where we start. Uh, let's see. Where start? Where start? Uh, and you can do history, race origins. Actually, you know what? I feel like, I feel like we should start with history. Because that one will help provide a basis of what the other ones are. And I'll let you pick the second one. I'll let you pick the second one that you, we go over. But I might start with history just because that provides some context. Uh, so we'll do history first. So I have the history of Arcadia broken up into a series of ages. Uh, starting with the birth of the world. It's an ev So I kind of have over here, you can see we have a name of what it is. If it's a specific event or if it's like an age that has happened, a description and a duration. So the birth of the world happened when Gaia and Uranus came together and made the world. So that's an event. And it starts with the age of monsters. And this is the time that Uranus ruled the worlds. And the birth of a many of the great beasts happened and the titans. So our next kind of event is the War of the Cosmos. And this is the war between the titans and Uranus with Kronos as its victor. So right now we're staying very much in the like, this is very fitting to Greek. This is going to be very fitting to Greek mythology. Uh, now we're going to start getting some weird things, though, because our next age is the Age of Chaos. And this is when Kronos rules. This is when we have the birth of the gods. And here you're going to start getting some weird ones. Because humans are not the first mortals. The first mortals are actually going to be the Tritons, the Giants, and the Dragonborns. And they're all going to emerge. And when I say we're going to talk about the race origins, this is when we get to talk about, like, who made what mortals? Because if Prometheus makes man, who made the rest? <laughs> uh, so in the Age of Chaos, we start getting some of them. The Titanmancy is an event that's the big war between the gods, the Titans and Zeus. So Zeus is the victor. And in this event, the Gorgons are made. So a little bit of a change to Medusa is not the first Gorgon. There's a whole group. Then we have the Age of Gods. So Zeus is ruling. We are now going to have create uh, the elves, the dwarves, the first Phaedron. There's two sets of Phaedron. So satyrs, centaurs, and pixies are made. The hobgoblins are going to emerge from the beasts bloodline. Sirens will emerge from the Tritons after a union with the first Phaedron. And a faction of the elves are cursed by Zeus to become harpies. <laughs> we now have my first war that I made up. And this is the Crixos War. This is a war between Arcadia 
and Nis. So Nis is kind of like the underdark of Arcadia. And this is taking a lot of um, bits and pieces from, there's an actual book called uh, Arcadia that is a Greek d d one like world, but they use their own, they use like a custom god set. And I said, no, screw you. I want to use the Greek gods. So some of, I think the Krixos and Nis are names that are coming from that book. But in this, uh, there's a war between Arcadia and Nis, so basically the Underdark and the Overworld. <laughs> uh, Arcadia has, is able to force Nixian out, but they cast a great plague of undeath on Arcadia. And so the plague of undeath is another event. And this plague wipes out a lot of the first mortals. It hits hardest in the Dragonborns, the Phaedrins, the Wood Elves, and it takes a massive effort from the Kirtan Elves, which is basically Sparta. Sparta is ruled by two boss-ass bitch queens, and they're cool, and they're elves, <laughs> and they're women. Anyways, um, it takes a massive effort from the Kirtan Elves to push the undeads back into the Galago Wilds, which, hey, we were in the Galago Wilds in The Last Mythos and Magic. Hmm. <laughs> before they retreat to recover their loss of thousands to the plague. The birth of man is our next event. So seeing that the world was dying, the mortals have taken a massive hit. Prometheus steals fire from the gods and creates humans. This sparks life back into Arcadia with a new race, and this new race of man keeps the undead at bay, allowing other mortals to recuperate and grow strong again. So now we are currently in the age of mortals. After the Crixos War and the Plague of Undeath, much of magic, much of the magic of gods was lost. Now mortals rule the world, though the gods still oversee and influence them. In this age, the late Phaedron, so gnomes and halflings, were created. Orcs emerge from the Dryant's bloodline, goblins and bugbears emerge from the Hobgoblin bloodline, and gnolls and Minotaur emerge from the Great Beasts. And on the cusp of this world is the Age of Man, which could be on the horizon for Arcadia. As the Pisarian Empire pushes hard to influence the, the gods, it includes the other mortal races. So we're maybe on the cusp of the Age of Man, Little little Lord of the Rings feeling in there. <laughs> but now that we have kind of a history lesson, <laughs> now I give you voting rights. <laughs> now you can have some voting rights, okay? What next? What next? Okay, so we get to talk I love about watching all your streams. They are my happy place. Harry love, Harry love. Thank you, Lethra Kitty. <laughs> We're keeping we're keeping the 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 alert box is allowed to make sound today. There we go. <laughs> okay, race origins. So when I say like the different bloodlines, that's what this is. Greek heroes on planes of existence. Boop 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 boop. boop. I'll even let you. I'll let you. Rig it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. You can rig it. You get rigging rights. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Boop, boop, boop. Let's see. Who's winning? Race Origins. Very good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh, the other ones are pushing around. It's wiggling. It's wiggling. It's wiggling hard. Guys, I have a whole family tree for these. <laughs> I have a whole family tree for the race origins. <laughs> okay, let's see. I think race origins is winning. Teehee. Teehee. Okay. Poggers. Alrighty. So, we're going to talk about where the different races come from. I have an entire freaking... Look at this. I have a freaking... <laughs> I have a whole thing! I have a whole thing! <laughs> okay. So. 
I have a whole freaking like setup of this uh where things came from people but I think I'll go through and actually kind of like list what they talk about um I forgot part of the things with Nis when I said it's kind of the underdark it's also Egypt <laughs> it's also Egypt <laughs> so I forgot the underdark basically gets to be uh the Egyptian gods instead so, uh, I have it that we have kind of, you know, the start of Greek mythology. We have Chaos makes Gaia and Tartarus. Uh, Uranus and Gaia give birth to a bunch of the Titans and the first giants. <laughs> but here, I think I will actually go through and I'll, I'll read out my little guys. So elves are our first, like, one of our first mortal races that were created in the age of mortals and they're created by hestia goddess of the hearth uh so they are uh crafted in the image of the gods and they were the first to walk the lands of arcadia alongside the children of gaia dragonborn are descendants from the great serpents and dragons of Arcadia, and the dragonborn pride themselves in their direct bloodline to Gaia. So if we go up here, Gaia, uh, Gaia and Tartarus, let's see, make the great monsters and the great serpents. The great monsters uh, later have the great beasts, which become gnolls and minotaurs. The great serpents give birth to, you know, the dragonborn. The great monsters become hobgoblins, which become goblins and bugbears. They kind of go down in a line. So the dragonborn are very proud of their direct connection to the earth. <laughs> we then have dwarves, which I think are cool. Um, dwarves say that Hephaestus, and you get to deal with however I pronounce Greek things. I'm sorry if you disagree with me. I'm just going to keep saying them how I say them, I think. <laughs> but Hephaestus made them in his image, carved from stone and molten bronze. He gave life into them and poured the best of him, his endurance and his strength and skill. They say that Nistros, which is one of my locations, and the volcanic isles were the forges where they were born. The fist, the first forge, that should not say the fist, that should say the first the first forge and since hephaestus gave them that flame the fire of the gods it has never gone cold so there are two kind of main types of dwarves in my campaign there are volcanic dwarves and there are field dwarves and so dwarves in arcadia are really good at blacksmithing or wine <laughs> they are very good at uh either like tending to the lands or making just really busted blacksmitheries just like really busted blacksmithing skills they're cool <laughs> so tritons are a funky one tritons are a funky one because that whole you know way that uh Aphrodite was made if you if you don't know Aphrodite's origin is that Kronos castrates his father and the result falls in the sea and from that sea there is sea foam and that sea foam creates Aphrodite in my world that sea foam also made the tritons <laughs> it made the goddess and it made the fish people <laughs> So, the Tritons, uh, <laughs> though born from the sea, the Tritons lived throughout the Age of Gods without strong ties to the sea god himself, Poseidon. Instead, Triton society was built up around the quest for knowledge and practice of the arts. Early in the Age of Gods, they claimed the Cilian Isles, as they were well equipped to travel between them and the mainland when needed. In this age, the Tritons built a great city, a marvel of architecture and art, in the name of their most worshipped goddess, Athena. While this irked Poseidon, he did nothing as not to upset the other gods. And shock wow, the Tritons built Atlantis! 
Atlantis stood from the age of chaos until the age of mortals. It was when humans came to Atlantis that trouble began. An ever knowledge hungry race, humans asked to learn knowledge of the Tritons, who were more than happy to teach it. Zeus was outraged by this, as he's still upset at the creations of humans in the first place, and he's now furious that the Tritons dare share their knowledge and history of the gods with these lesser mortals. He ordered Poseidon to destroy the city. Poseidon readily obliged and brought his full fury down on the city of Atlantis. Great waves crashed and earthquakes fell throughout. Arcadia split open the sea and pulled the great city below the waters. Many Tritons died, and those that survived had to move to the neighboring isles, though many elected to leave altogether and either travel to the mainland of Arcadia or out further into the Arcadian Sea. The remaining Cilian Isles still survive, the largest of which, Sami, retains a decent population, but much of the Triton knowledge and culture was buried with Atlantis. Many quests venture out to retrieve drowned artifacts, but the spires were tall and the stones heavy. Now in the age, in the end of the Age of Gods, the Triton are a small people, ones that are rarely seen and never in the shining light they once were. So, hee <laughs> hee. I think those are cool. <laughs> I think they're neat. <laughs> so, the next one is Gorgons. And Gorgons are a funky one. So, in this world, Gorgons are created directly by Gaia in the War of the Gods and Titans to aid the Titans in battle. So, Gaia basically made them to aid her children, her direct children, uh, during the war so in the titan mancy but since the titan were defeated many gods and mortals have hunted down the gorgon for the glory and uh, a kill of a gorgon brings them as their numbers have dwindled the remaining gorgon prayed for help rhea was the one to hear their pleas and felt guilty for their suffering since she aided the gods and helped Zeus take down her father. She saw that her action had forsaken this, these people whose creator now ignored them. Ah, this is something that I have since written out of the lore. I had it that Rhea was the one to grant the Gorgon the power to hide amongst mortals. After this, most of the Gorgons dispersed into society, hiding in plain sight. So, in the past uh, of this, I had it that Gorgons could naturally transform into looking like humans. We have since changed that for my current Arcadia one, where instead they have to use a magic ring to do that. But uh, basically, still keeping that Gaia made the Gorgons to help her children, and now they are kind of shamed for being on the losing side of the war. <laughs> ba -ba -ba -bum. So the first Phaedron, which is a lot of our, of our squad, Inspired by Hestia and Hephaestus' creation, Pan made several mortals of his own design. So Pan, Pan looks at them and says, I want to do that too! And then keeps making them. <laughs> he just makes a lot. So these mortals were more unique through their creation. Instead of new mortals being born, these beings were created from magic of the Fey Wilds and influence of emotion. There are many entrances to the Fey Wilds in Arcadia, and rumor says that one can even enter it unintentionally when lost deep in the woods. In the wilds, magic is stronger, and emotions of those not Fey in the wilds can influence its form. Feelings of intense joy and happiness will bring a pixie into the world, while feelings of content and calm can bring forth a satyr. Centaurs are spawned from a feeling of loyalty and dedication, and sprites are created from jealous, envious, or even mischievous emotion. I have it that these Fae cannot... I think this is a lie. I think this is a lie. I think I've now had it that they can, in fact, procreate. In the past, they couldn't procreate to create new Fae, but can occasionally have children with other races. One such union did spawn the Sirens. So, likely, someone had a time with the Tritons and made a bunch of Sirens about it. <laughs> Thank you for the hydrate. The second Phaedrons are made by the creation of uh, this time. Shock wow, Pan really looked at humans and said, that but shorter. 
<laughs> that short cut like an entire foot off that guy maybe more <laughs> and so pan creates the gnomes and the halflings so gnomes and halflings i think are the newest uh mortal races in arcadia and i i realized there's a really cool bonus piece do i have it in is it creature lore i do so there's some funky creatures that also spawn uh some of the classic D, &D races uh so some really well-known creatures from greek mythology callisto the bear is a great bear from greek mythos she is now known as the mother of dire bears which we had a whole thing where wow one of the mother the great mothers was missing in the last one and it was a big old dire bear <laughs> oh this is a word i do not know how to sp say the imanthian boar is the father of the dire boars the cretan bull is the father of the minotaur the Lycaon wolf is the alpha of the dire wolves. The Crota Crocatus hyena is the mother of gnolls. The Nemean lion still exists, but I haven't figured out if potentially like mother of the tabac, like father of the tabaxi, which I'm going to write down. Father of Maxi. We're going to write that down. Build some lore right now. And the Hind of Canera is a stag, a really big stag, and I don't think I have a connection for, for him quite yet. But I like them. They're cool. <laughs> I think they're neat. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Boop, 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 boop. Boop, boop. Would you guys like to vote on which one we talk about next? <laughs> Here, I'll let you vote again. Who? What next? Boop, doop, boop. Let's see. We'll do heroes or planes of existence. Yep. Yep. Boop. There you go. You get rights. Ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Funky and neat. I'm glad that you guys think so. <laughs> I'm having fun just getting to kind of talk about it and. Yeah, pan, pan went ham. So true. Yes. And thank you for the hydrations. The hydrations are probably important during this one as I'm just babbling. <laughs> I'm babbling on. Ooh, ooh, they're so evenly split right now. OMG. Oh, they're so evenly split right now. Oh, oh, planes of existence is starting to pull ahead. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Planes of Existence is trying to pull ahead. Da 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 da. Oh, Heroes is pulling. Heroes is pulling ahead. It's switched. It's switched. Ah. <laughs> oh my gosh. They're going to end at like 50 50. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, there we go. 51 49. <laughs> Perfect. That was very close. We're going to talk about Heroes. So, in these. Uh, I have rewritten some of the heroic lore into basically like what D&D uh, &D race they are and some extra details of it. So Greek heroes. So Achilles. Achilles' tale stems from the dragonborn who believed he was dipped in the water of the Styx and made invulnerable during a time of fighting with the hobgoblins from Gargados. Well, not my locations. <laughs> it is used to explain the natural weakness of dragonborns in places they have lost their scales. And hobgoblins use this story to share the fall of Achilles as an ultimate victory in power, even against those blessed by the gods. So you can kind of see here what I mean by like, we're taking the Greek mythos and we're taking the D&D &D races and we're saying, <laughs> be friends make cool shit together <laughs> so i like it of uh achilles's heel is now the you know missing missing scales of a dragon board so hercules is the first human child of zeus this outraged hera who preferred the elves 
And she set about destroying Hercules and all he cared for. This story highlights human perseverance and the cruelty of elves as typically uh, King Eurythides is depicted as a Kirtan king in these tales. Jason. Jason, the story of Jason and the Golden Fleece is found in both elven and dragonborn cultures. The dragonborn claim that only a dragonborn could have been blessed by the Cloatian dragon, but the elves see themselves in Jason's cunning strategy and believe him to be an early Kirtan elf. This is something else I like doing in my D&D stories is there isn't an exact right answer or there's different ways that cultures view the same story. So I think that kind of bit is really cool where you have like them getting to fight over who they think Jason actually was. And this is um, really cool to my opinion. <laughs> uh, Perseus has a really interesting, the way that people see different is different the same story different views perseus's story originates from kirta to the elves it is a story of glory against a long enemy the gorgon by slaying one of their most powerful medusa to the gorgons though the story of perseus is cruel and horrific Elven tellings of the tale include a great fight with Perseus's wit winning him the day, while Gorgons spread word of the elf who snuck into their home and murdered Medusa in cold blood. This is a fun way that I think of there's there's two like different ways that uh, Perseus's story is often told in Greek myth of either he uses the shield to like sneakily look at Medusa and fight her or he uses the shield to murder Medusa when she's asleep. So I liked both versions of that story. So I have it in both ways represented in my D&D world. He. Theseus is going to be a pretty interesting one coming up in the next Mythos and Magic session. He's the legendary founder of Hyperium. Humans look up to the human integrity and ingenuity and bravery of Theseus. I don't have much written here, but Theseus is one of the human heroes. One of the founders of the Hyperion. Uh, Hyperium is one is the like crown city of the Hyperion Alliance, which is the human realm, uh, the human kind of kingdom. It's more city states. It's a series of city states, <laughs> and. Theseus's story will come into play quite interestingly in the next one. Atlanta is more commonly told of by humans as she was said to be tossed from elven society for being born a half-elf, half-human. And her defeat of the Atlantean boar is said to have happened in Ilria. Ilria is one of the uh, big three cities of the Hyperion Alliance. It's Hyperium, Ilria, and Ithia. Icarus, Shockwell, <laughs> and his father, Dadlius, originate from dwarven tales that are uh, cautionary tales of vanity and overconfidence in one's designs. Bah, 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 bah. Oh, then we get down into just all the O's, all the O names. <laughs> Uh, Oedipus is various versions of this tale stretch across Arcadia with a shared lesson of a person often meets his destiny on the road he took to avoid it. It is most often a lesson from fate clerics, which is a really cool custom domain for from the Arcadia book uh, is fate as one of the cleric realms. <laughs> Orpheus is a tale often told through the songs of satyrs, and it is unclear if Orpheus himself was a satyr. Odysseus's tale is a dwarven story, which grew and grew as tales were added as it was often told over drinks. So <laughs> the Odyssey just keeps going. <laughs> and uh, the Trojan War. The Trojan War is said to have happened early in the Age of Gods between the elves and, a Tro and Troy, a city of Phaedron. So, Phaedron City. Tee -hee. Tee -hee. Which leaves my most complicated diagram, guys. <laughs> the planes of existence. <laughs> the 
planes of existence gets an entire fucking chart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent way too long on this. <laughs> so. I have a lot of stuff that goes into this one. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to go over all of it. I don't know if we're going over all of it. I have like so much stuff. Let me shrink that. Can I shrink it so that I can at least put it all on the screen at once? Okay, I can. Great. Um. Oops, I forgot how big this one is. <laughs> so this is me blending. This is like the best blend of Greek myth and like D&D lore. Because we have everything is contained within chaos, the physical embodiment of the chaos plane. It is the void that fills the space between all planes. And shock wow. Um, it's kind of funny that some of these are like I'm seeing like unintentional things that I might have pulled from my brain and put into Fable. <laughs> As I see uh, physical bodies of a primordial god, uh, Uranus is the physical embodiment of the ethereal plane. So the ethereal plane like is Uranus himself. Same with Tartarus is the physical embodiment of the astral plane. Gaia is the physical embodiment of the material plane. We then have kind of the next section is uh, planes ruled by primordial gods. Uh, and we then like it kind of goes like physical embodiments of primordial gods ruled by primordial gods, physical bodies of a non primordial god and ruled by non primordial gods. <laughs> There's also some that have no rulers and like different ways that you can be transported between them. <laughs> so, uh, some of our, 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 our planes, we have the plane of water is ruled by Pontus and the plane of earth by Orea. Plane of air is ruled by the Anomi and the plane of fire is ruled by Hestia because I think that's cool. <laughs> I think the hearth goddess should rule the fire realm. <laughs> So we also have uh, basically the Feywilds in the Shadow Realm. So the Armanthia is the Feywilds. It's ruled by Aether, which is light, and Hermea, which is day. And the mirror is, it's a mirror of the material plane. Pan usually hangs out in there. The Shadowfell is ruled by Nyx, night, and Herberus, darkness. It's a mirror of the material plane as well. The Plane of Dreams is ruled by Hypnos. And the plane of time is the physical embodiment of uh, Kronos, not the Chaos Titan. There's very unhelpfully two Kronos gods. <laughs> one of them is spelled different than the other one. One of them has an H in it. The other one sometimes has a C or a K. It depends. <laughs> but if you get down into Tartarus, uh, you can, uh, wait, I like skipped. I skipped the ethereal plane realms. We have basically the ethereal plane, the celestial plane, and then the Elysian fields. Uh, so that's where you kind of get heroes hang out here uh, when they die. Hyperius is the celestial plane. So that's where you would get like the equivalent of angels, but they wouldn't really be called angels in this world. Then if you jump down to Tartarus, uh, the astral plane gets to play the role of Tartarus. Uh, the sticks is a physical barrier and embodiment of the god of sticks. <laughs> uh, it's the physical barrier between the material planes and the dead planes. So Hades is the plane of the dead. It's ruled by Hades. And Deep Tartarus is the prison of the Titans. And I have a whole fucking, like, groupings of planes. Like, primary planes, higher secondary planes, lower secondary planes, Mirror planes, outer planes, the void. <laughs> There's too many of them. Um, but here, we can at least read some of the fun bits from them. So, about the ethereal plane. Uh, the primordial god Uranus is the physical embodiment and ruler of the, of the ethereal plane. That should say the ethereal plane, not the, not the, not that. Ethereal plane. Ethereal plane. The appearance of this one is an ocean of stars, clouds, and sunset colors. Looking down through the waters may show glimpses into the other planes. The inhabitants 
Uh, typically, it's only used as a transport between the planes or a looking glass to the other planes. Entrances to this plane is uh, Uranus physically touches the material plane in two places, Mount Hyperius and the Titan Atlas. At these places, mortals may enter, but they are most often immediately detected as the gods watch these entries closely from their place in Hyperius. The gods themselves can move freely through this plane and take others with them. So I have like little inspiration photos on the side that was like, this is the ethereal plane. <laughs> The material plane, Shockwow, is where people live. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, not it's not ruled directly by Gaia. She's more of the physical embodiment of it. Uh, and it's inhabited by immortals, fey, fiends, undead, ghosts, and more. But Tartarus is the astral plane. I pff, apparently did not update that. That uh, Apparently I sucked at updating things. I did a lot of copy-paste and was sleepy. But... The appearance of Tardis is an unending dark beach. The sands are gray to black and storm clouds roll above but never rain. At the shore laps the river Styx and the lining uh, and lining the plain are souls of the dead. Inhabitants is Cerberus, which is an astral dreadnought in this world, uh, guards the river Styx to make sure none pass without, without the journey, uh, without journeying with Chiron. The souls of the dead, sometimes will be friendly, sometimes not, are waiting for their turn to cross. Others may be in denial, and others may be wailing, angered, or desperate to cross over. More recently, deceased souls will retain much of their appearance that they did in life, but the longer one waits on the astral shores, the more abstract their form becomes. And there are three main ways to reach Tartarus. By being escorted by a higher power, to die, or to find one of the openings in the material plane. Openings to Tartarus, Tartarus can be found scattered throughout the material plane, typically in deep caverns and caves. These can pass through the through to enter the astral plane, but will be challenging to navigate and most do not return. Souls of the dead will be transported from the material plane to the astral plane to be awaited by Chiron and Thantanos. So, dark, unending beach. <laughs> Tee hee. The higher secondary plane, Hyperius, is the celestial plane. That's basically Olympus. So, ruler is Zeus. Appearance is glorious, rich, and a perfect city, lined in gold and covered in art. It appears to be sitting upon a mountain covered in clouds at the top, a mighty temple where the pantheon of gods meet. Portions of it may appear broken or damaged in times of war, and deep in this place one may find rundown temples of forgotten or lesser gods. The inhabitants are most gods and some titans, though they may not all live there at all times. All deities do have a place in Hyperius. And the entrance to the ethereal plane is the physical contact, uh, which is at the Mount Hyperius. It's very, very thin. And typically one will travel directly to Hyperius by entering through one of these thin contact points. The Elysian Fields are overseen by Zeus from Hyperius, but there are no rulers of this plane. It looks like a lavish countryside sculpted from the stars. Souls of mortals and heroes and some dead gods inhabit it. And the entrance is only accessible with the help of a god. Though there is no direct connection to the material plane, the Elysian fields can be seen from it, taking the form of stars in the sky. The lower secondary planes, the river Styx, is the first one and the titan goddess Styx is the physical embodiment of the river. It is gray to black waters that share the shore of the astral plane. And the inhabitants is Styx herself. She may take on a titan or humanoid form and is the only main inhabitant other than the ferryman Chiron. And this plane can be entered from the astral plane, but without the guidance of Chiron, it will be painful and likely a deadly experience. Hades is ruled by Hades and Persephone. It varies in appearance depending on the area. It can be volcanic and awful to a mirroring of the material plane. The areas are separated by rivers that run from the sticks. Hades' palace is made of mostly black, gold laced marble all around it are gardens and inside is actually quite warm and hospitable the inhabitants are hades persephone and souls of the undead hecate 
The Furies and the Judges of the Dead, and several minor gods and nymphs may also inhabit inhabit Hades. The entrances are that they, uh, souls and mortals must be brought from the sticks to gain access to Hades, but gods, nymphs, and other higher powers can cross directly over to it. I am... Do I... I have so many more. I don't know if I want to go through all of them, but, you know, I can. We can keep reading. Do you guys want me to keep reading? Do you want me to keep going through these? I don't have to. <laughs> I know that it's kind of, like, really nerdy <laughs> to... to dig through my own world lore. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Good timing on the hydrate. Good timing on the hydrate. Mm. So. Deep Tartarus. Deep Tartarus is ruled and overseen by the primordial god Tartarus. It's a deep, dark pit. On the way down... Uh, it's as if the spell darkness is cast, and at the bottom, some light is emitted from the titans and beast trap there. The current inhabitants are Kronos, the titans, Kyrus. Oh, there's a lot. There's a lot, and I'm not going to read them all because I'm going to screw up some names. The mortal. There's a few mortal souls as well. But the entrance to Tartarus is a locked gate that only very powerful magic can open. Zeus is capable of opening it and will do so to toss others into imprisonment. <laughs> the Mirror Plains are our Feywilds and the Shadowfell. Yes, welcome in. We are talking about Mythos lore. This is like world lore from Mythos. Hee <laughs> So, the Feywilds. The ruler is Aether, the primordial god of light, and Hermea, the primordial goddess of day. The appearance is that it is a mirror of the material plane. There is a stronger magic presence and the colors appear more vivid. So this is kind of my little reference photo for the Feywilds. The inhabitants are the first Phaedron, created and living primarily in this plane. Pan also hangs out there quite a bit, as well as many nymphs and nature-related deities, as the earth of Amaria is more fertile and then the material plane. The entrances, there are many. Uh, some known, many unknown. And it is said that you can pass into Armanthia by getting lost in the woods and wilds of the material world. Nibis is the Shadowfeld. The ruler is Nyx, the primordial goddess of night. And Herberus, the primordial god of darkness. It appears dark and desaturated. Buildings will appear to be in decay even when they are not in the material plane. And this is inhabited by fiends, undead, and monsters. Not many gods visit or inhabit this plane. So, like the Feywilds, it has many entrances. One of them, uh, one can stumble into this plane in places of deep darkness. So, another little reference picture of what this could look like. So, the other planes, I, uh, the outer planes... We got our, our funky thoughts of outer plane. We start getting into weird abstract boys, and I love them. My weird abstract boys heart. My little water, water plane. Water plane first. Ruled by Pontus, the primordial god of the sea. It's endless waves and ocean. Many gods, titans, nymphs, and creatures of the sea live there. The plane of earth is ruled by the primordial god of mountains. It's vast caverns of stone, crystals, and gems. Lava bubbles up in areas. Mountain nymphs, gods of earth, mountains, and volcanoes all live there. A very, it's like a big, giant cave that just keeps caving. <laughs> Much cave, big cave. Plane of air. The Armerni, the Borealis of the North Wind, Aurelius of the East Wind, Nortus of the South Wind, and Zephyrus of the West Wind are the rulers of this plane. The floating isles of a sea of sky. Wind blows near constantly as they are merely travel, and inhabitants are creatures of flight. Pretty. <laughs> ba -ba -ba -ba. My plane of fire, plane of fire. Hestia, though previously it was a primordial god who has since been lost, is now so Hestia is now the ruler. She gave up her place in the pantheon both to allow Dionysus a seat and to set up uh, and to step up and rule the plane of fire. The appearance is not all fire and hell like one might expect. 
Since Hestia's arrival, this plane has shifted into the life force of other planes. It provides warmth and protection for others and appears as a glowing palace well lit with flames in all colors. While some monsters and creatures still live here, many are tamed and friendly to others in it. Gods favored by Hestia often reside within this plane, including Styx's children, Nike, Zealous, Kratos, and Bia. So, just warm sunset palace colors. I like the plane of fire not just being hellfire. I think it's kind of fun when it's the hearth instead of just fire. The plane of time. This is ruled by the god Kronos. It's the physical, he's the physical embodiment of the plane of time. It appears to be layers of colored thread that form shapes and scenes. The threads are the threads of time and fate, one that only a few gods and the fates can truly decipher. Mortals can catch glimpses of their connection, but may go mad from prolonged exposure to, in delving in too deep of this plane. So that's where you get this funky shape. So Kronos inhabits this realm, as well as other time gods, uh, and the fates are common. <laughs> Kronos went shapes and colors. So true. The plane of dreams is ruled by Hypnos. It is a warped view of the material plane. And Hypnos and Morpheus, god of dreams. Uh, his brother Euphales is the god of nightmares, and they are at war within this plane. Nyx is a common visitor to this plane, but the most popular visitors are the mortal spirits in their sleep. So, dream realm, dream realm, I think it's cool. <laughs> and the final one we have is the void itself. This is uh, chaos. The primordial god of chaos is the physical embodiment of the plane of chaos. It appears as endless floating ruins of earth, stone, and burning fire. The inhabitants of this plane are only those who are unwilling. They were either banished or lost to the voids of chaos between the planes. So this is where you get just a smashed apart world that has pieces in it. Yes. <laughs> so... I have just so many things that I have thought about for this world. Um, <laughs> I'll even show you a little here. I'll show you a little hint about like what the rest of this document looks like. Uh, if I expand it a little bit, you can even see. Yeah, you can see all that's all my pages that are just in the world building lore. Uh, there's a lot of them. I have entire things that are just on like cultural notes, cultures of Kirta, the state of Gargados, that what the different territories like to talk to each other about, uh, concept arts of me just saving art that I think is pretty as like good, like ways to just just get my brain going, just get my brain going about things. A little sneak peek about what my what my DM notebook looks like. What am I using for it? This is all in OneNote, actually. I'm kind of funny. I, I use OneNote for my DM notes. Uh, I like it a lot. <laughs> and I've made a bunch of charts about it. <laughs> I went and made so many charts about it. I just think it's fun. I think it's fun, y'all. But that's my deep dive into into the, into the funky f mythos and magic lore the world lore i am currently working on the next mythos and magic game i'm very excited i think it will be very cool uh oh i'm excited about it <laughs> i've started poking my uh my my players to be like guys guys we're doing things hmm do I do a minor in Greek mythology or did I do all this in my own time? I did this all in my own time. Um, my degree is in aerospace engineering. <laughs> because that's what I am. If you didn't know this, uh, I'm an aerospace engineer. Lol. <laughs> will this be posted on the VOD channel? Absolutely it will. Which also uh, on the VOD channel will be, I think should be, the Jackbox streams are going up. Uh, in theory now they have got, maybe one went up maybe one didn't go up they should go up soon 
And they're ready. They might they might be waiting for me to post. <laughs> Lol. Oh, right. We posted uh the Stardew one recently, and then soon uh, I think tomorrow I'll put up the I'll I'll put the Jackbox stream up tomorrow. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> As someone who does minor in archaeology, this is so much bigger than a BA basics. It's more like a whole thesis paper. Oops. <laughs> Oops, me when me when I got to sit there and think too hard about stuff. Oops. <laughs> uh I want this kind of document. I want to make like it'd be interesting to try and make a giant document on fable like this, but I just have a huge horde of just a, a stack of lore documents in a Google Drive <laughs> that are all just piles and piles. Piles and piles of things. <laughs> uh, bah, bah, bah. Uh, bah, bah. But tomorrow, we are going to go film a CMV. I'm very excited about it. We have a new Fable outfit for it. We have a new Isla outfit for it. Actually, two new Isla outfits, I think. Uh, much filming. I'm very excited. I'm also excited because uh, the uh, creator of the Fable finale t-shirt is coming to help me film. And I'm going to be modeling the Fable finale t-shirt while we're there. It's funny. I'm going to be modeling it while cosplaying Isla because I will have already have my wig on. Lol. <laughs> but tee. <laughs> yeah, CMV, CMV. That's why we have the uh the little the little sub goal. Sub goal boy is CMV mock up. Because we're doing fun things we're doing fun things. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> I ba 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 do I have a picture of one of the Fable fits? I think oh I have a picture of one of the Isla fits. Ba 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 ba. Ba ba ba. You know what? Chat. If you hit the first sub goal, I'll also give you the Isla fit. How's that? <laughs> I'll 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 give you I'll give you the Isla fit as well if you hit the first sub goal. <laughs> Isla and her modeling arc. So true. So true. Isla going to hang out. <laughs> Uh ba 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 But I think that's all my bits today. I just wanted to talk about my silly D D things, especially because I'm not gonna be streaming tomorrow, uh, since I will be CMVing tomorrow instead. <laughs> I will be CMVing tomorrow instead, and it will be fun. I am hopeful that it will go well. <laughs> I hope it will go well. <laughs> I am nervous, Bean. <laughs> I am nervous, Bean. But it is fine. <laughs> oh, love silly D&D stuff. Me too. I'm I'm very happy about it. I'm excited. And uh, keep an eye on some cantripped things. Perhaps. Perhaps there was something else I did in D&D related things over there. <laughs> oh, whoa. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Tee -hee. But yeah. I think with that, chat, uh, yeah. I think it's time to send y'all off. I have so much more stuff to go be working on for the finale, so you know me. I gotta get back on that grind. <laughs> I gotta get back on that grind! <laughs> I have been doing so much work for the finale. I'm excited, but oh, ah, bah, 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 bah. it will be cool. And I am excited and terrified at the same time. It's great. <laughs> but thank you guys for sticking around and listening to me just talk about my crazy little D&D &D thing. I love it a lot. I think it's fun. I might go toss some of those, uh, like, uh, uh, copies of the the charts and stuff. I might toss those over on my Patreon. We'll 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 see. <laughs> we'll see the vibes.